Good day. This is Jerry Mayberry with Echosins North America. On behalf of Echosins North America, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar on the clinical benefits of combined liver stiffness and ultrasound attenuation rate testing in fatty liver disease patients. Today's webinar is brought to you by an unrestricted grant to the AASLD by Echosins North America and provided to the AASLD as a courtesy from Dr. Raj Bhagalanchi. To start with, I would like to talk about a recent case that I had in my clinic. This is um, an eight-year-old white man with a fatty liver of, on ultrasound. Um, he was otherwise asymptomatic. On exam, he had few features of metabolic syndrome. BMI was around 35. He had hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes. On the blood work, it revealed that um, bilirubin was normal, albumin was normal, INR was normal. So I got a sense that the synthetic function of the liver is preserved. When I looked at his liver enzymes, AST39 and ALT43, and this is from a local lab where the ALT range is, is ranges from 21 to 72, which is upper limit of normal. So he was thinking liver enzymes were normal. I don't know why I'm here, Doc, was his uh, opening introduction. So this is a topic uh, that uh, is of um, interest to many people, of course. Um, ASLD recommends that the upper limit of ALT is 19 for a woman and 29 for a man. Our own institution has 45 in some labs have as high as 72 in this one. Hemoglobin A1C was 7.3%. Um, viral hepatitis was uh, negative and platelet count was 237,000. So there was really no indication that patient had cirrhosis or compromised synthetic function. So the questions in my mind were, uh, I know that he has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. He denied significant alcohol use, um, but does he have NASH? If he does, does he have advanced fibrosis? Um, should I really subject him to a liver biopsy? I mean, he's 80 years old. Uh, what would be the ideal non-invasive way for me to assess his liver fibrosis? And how do I even follow him over time? His enzymes, as I said, were very unimpressive. And for me to follow these near normal liver enzymes uh, may not be much help. So what exactly do we mean by NAPLD? Uh, uh, when I staff the fellows clinic, there's often confusion with regard to how we use this terminology. The patient just has an imaging study and there is fat in the liver we use the word non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But anything below that, which is NAFL or NASH, has to have a liver biopsy because these are a histologic diagnosis. And when the liver biopsy is done, we know plain fatty liver, which is NAFL, for at least liver-related uh, outcomes, it is pretty benign. And if there is inflammation, cell death, fibrosis, then we feel that this is NASH and there is concern that if we don't do anything about it, uh, it may progress to cirrhosis over time. Currently, we do not have any FDA-approved NASH-specific treatments, but again, as you all know, there is intense research in this area. There are several clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and some phase three. So it is very important moving forward that we identify patients with NASH so that we may intervene with lifestyle change in addition to liver specific treatment. The usual presentations or common reasons for consultation related to NAFLD are either elevated liver tests where no imaging study has been done or elevated liver tests with ultrasound that most often in my experience is done for ruling out gallbladder disease shows normal gallbladder and fat in the liver. More recently, 
um, I am getting consults for just plain fatty liver, sometimes with normal liver tests. Um, this, I assume, is related to more awareness about NASH and um, definitely getting more referrals from primary care physicians with regard to fatty liver on imaging study with or without elevated liver enzymes. With NAFLD, uh, abnormal liver tests that we see are typically enzymes less than 200. For the most part, alpha's is normal, and as such, we say it is hepatocellular pattern. And these enzymes may fluctuate over time, and that makes it even more difficult for us to use liver enzymes as a monitoring tool. Current challenges in managing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's very common, one in three. That translates to about 100 million people with fatty liver. Liver enzymes, unfortunately, do not distinguish plain fatty liver or NASH. Um, NASH is a histologic diagnosis, it requires a liver biopsy, and there are some inherent issues with liver biopsy, which include sampling variability with regard to where the actual tissue was obtained, observer variability, which means the expertise of your local pathologist and their experience, and it is, at the end of the day, an invasive procedure, however safe we think it is. Unfortunately, there are no established non-invasive biomarkers for NASH. So whenever we talk about a NAFLD patient, we have to think about these issues that often come up in our mind. NAFLD, NAFL, NASH, NASH without fibrosis, NASH with fibrosis. And if there is fibrosis, is it early, which is essentially F0, F1? Clinically significant, which is F2 or greater, advanced, which is F3 and F4. And often we think about to biopsy or not to biopsy. Now, the recent guidelines with regard to fatty liver, they recommend uh, to think about liver biopsy in patients who have metabolic syndrome with elevated liver enzymes. Now, an ideal non-invasive test that would help us diagnose NASH should give us some degree of steatosis severity and some degree of fibrosis. It has to be simple, readily available, reliable, and cheap. Right now, other than imaging study that de describes us with regard to degree of fibrosis, we haven't had much until availability of CAP. Um, with regard to serologic markers for degree of fibrosis, we often use these two in our practice. NAFLD fibrosis score, which is recommended by the guidelines, and then FIP4 index. These use very simple, readily available blood tests for calculation and give a score. Based on that, there is a cutoff which helps us identify either patients with advanced fibrosis or very minimal fibrosis. Anything in between is indeterminate. As you see, both the scores help in identification of advanced fibrosis with good diagnostic accuracy. This is a recent paper that summarized several studies using these scores and um, they have reported that up to 50% could end up with scores that are indeterminate and we wouldn't know whether we should proceed further with the liver biopsy or not. So I applied these two scores to Billy's case. Um, these scores are available at a website, gihep.com. This is hosted by one of our faculty members. So I put in Billy's numbers for FIP4 score, and based on the score of 2.01, it was indeterminate range. For NAFLD fibrosis score, it, it predicted significant fibrosis. And mind you, this is a patient with normal platelet count, near normal liver enzymes, and I have scores telling me two different things. 
So this is where um, we used FibroScan. Um, we routinely obtain FibroScan with uh, LSM and cap measurement by vibration control tensing elastography in our clinic. This is in the clinic and uh, patient gets it th during the same clinic visit and we discuss the results right away. It comes with two probe sizes, medium and extra large. Um, I apologize for any pediatric hepatologist. There is a small, also small probe recently approved. Um, I don't have a picture of that. But the probes differ in certain ways. The extra large probe is needed to overcome the skin to liver capsule distance. But the area that the stiffness is measured is essentially the same with either probe. This cylinder area that is measured and that is used to measure the liver stiffness is approximately 100 times the volume of a liver biopsy core. So essentially, there is value in decreasing the sampling error due to increased area of the liver that is being examined. The basic premise in which this technology works is a vibration is generated and it passes through the liver and that's called the shear wave. The ultrasound is used to measure the speed at which the shear wave is passing through the liver. If there is a lot of scarring in the liver, the wave moves fast. If there is very minimal scarring or the liver is normal, the wave moves slow. And based on the speed at which the shear wave moves through the liver, the elastance is calculated using Young's modulus. And that constitutes the liver stiffness in measurement, and that's reported in kilopascals. Now, this technology has been available in Europe for a, more than a decade. Um, it had taken some time to come to US because of lack of extra large probe. Most of the data that is in the literature is with regard to viral hepatitis and cholestatic liver disease with a medium probe. And there is emerging data with regard to use of medium and extra large probe for the evaluation of fatty liver. As you see, there are some cutoffs that helps us recognize the degree of fibrosis in a patient. And these cutoffs may vary with regard to the etiology of liver disease. So one should be careful in using cutoff from hepatitis B and applying it to fatty liver. One of the recent papers with regard to liver fibrosis and liver stiffness measurement. This is the stage of fibrosis in patients who have undergone liver biopsy for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 110 patients. And this is on the y-axis is the liver stiffness measurement. These are box plots and there's a good gradation with regard to degree of liver stiffness measurement but as you see, there may be overlap. And I'll tell you how we need to overcome this issue. So if we were to categorize fatty liver as clinically significant, which is F2 to F4, or not, which is F0, F1, and try to figure out the optimal cutoff. Because at the end of the day, if you have a patient with NASH or NAFLD, and you want to know if the patient has advanced fibrosis or clinically significant fibrosis, which is F2 or greater, by the time it is F3, it's probably already too late and we may have missed the boat. But if you want to recognize early, which is F2 or greater, what would be the ideal cutoff when you have the fibro skin? These are several studies. As you see, many of them are with medium probe because of the recent availability of extra large probe. We don't have much data. This is the sample size of these studies, and this is the percentage of the patients with F2 or greater in that sample. Um, and these are the cutoffs that they found with good diagnostic accuracy 
sensitivity, and specificity. And these cutoffs range anywhere from 6.6 .6 up to 11. This is the most recent study from Japan. And again, one has to recognize that these are Asian, European, Japanese. Um, there's not much data from United States. Um, for example, this study, if you choose a lower cutoff, your sensitivity increases, but your specificity goes down. If you choose a higher cutoff, your sensitivity goes down, but your specificity increases. So if you have a patient with higher LSM, more likely you would find advanced fibrosis. Um, this is the optimal cutoff for cirrhosis. Similarly, several studies, medium probe, sample size. This is a percent with patients with cirrhosis in that cohort, and this is the cutoff. Again, there's variable cutoffs that have been reported. And in general, if you choose a higher cutoff, your sensitivity goes down, but specificity increases. Completely different from liver stiffness measurement is controlled attenuation parameter, which gives a sense of degree of fat in the liver. It is simultaneous. The device will acquire data with regard to stiffness and cap at the same time. Essentially, the loss of the ultrasound due to the fat in the liver is what is controlled attenuation parameter. More the fat, more the loss. So this is the attenuation rate. It is measured in decibels per meter. And the range is anywhere from 100 to 400. So max is 400 decibels per meter. A normal liver would have low attenuation rate and a fatty liver would have high attenuation rate. For example, you look at this study. If there is steatosis grade zero or one, the attenuation rate is lower. If there is steatosis grade two or grade three, this, the attenuation rate is higher. And you will realize that there is a lot of overlap here too. So there has been studies comparing um, other non-invasive measurements of liver fat which are MR spectroscopy in this study. They compared CAP and MR spectroscopy in patients with biopsy-proven NAPLD. This is the histology grading, which we have as grade one, two, and three. These are the controls with no fat. And this is the CAP, and this is the MR spectroscopy where you found the report fat fraction percent. As you see, there is a good gradation Similarly, we see that in MR spectroscopy. So optimal cutoff per cap for detection of grade three is around 300 decibels per meter per meter. And optimal cutoff for healthy patient would be 215 in this study. So Another potential alternative to liver biopsy for estimation of uh, hepatic fat content is uh, MRI by PDFF. This currently is the most uh, advanced way of looking at liver fat. Proton density fat fraction by MR. Um, recent study, 142 patients with liver biopsy proven NAFLD. This is the grade of steatosis on liver biopsy, and this is the fat fraction by PDFF. This is the diagnostic accuracy for each stage of hepatic steatosis. Again, very nice differentiation between different stages of uh, steatosis, different grades of steatosis, and very comparable to MRI PDFF. These are the diagnostic accuracies sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value and negative predictive value.
in another study with M probe and extra large probe for uh, fat fraction with MRI for 8% fat in the liver. The cutoff seems to be around 267 decibels per meter for medium probe and 270 for extra large probe. For 15%, 16% fat seems to be around 300 decibels per meter. Many of the treatment trials for NAFLD NASH that are at least in phase two, they are looking for patients with 15% fat or 10% fat to show improvement in the therapeutic clinical trial. And this is a good way of identifying patients who would benefit from treatment trial who would have at least 15% or 10% fat based on the CAP score in the clinic. So FibroScan, we use it in the clinic, as I said. It helps us with several parameters. I'll go over each one. This often is done by your technician and uh, the report is given to you for interpretation. This is the CAP score. This is the liver stiffness measurement by vibration control transient elastography. This is IQ, IQR. Generally, less than 30%, you have a reliable um, value. If it is more than 30%, then there's too much variability. This is the median velocity, but this is converted to the cap. So really, we, I, I don't pay much attention to this number. This is the progression of the shear wave through the liver. And this is the skin to liver capsule distance. This is the ultrasound. The strength is, decreases as it passes through the liver. And this is the ultrasound that shows the liver. So if you have any vascular malformation, you have a rib, you would easily see it here. And if you see this amplitude not going this pattern, then you know that something's not right. So Billy had the fibro scan in the clinic, and this is the report that my nurse gave to me. His stiffness score was 40.5 decibels per, and this is kilopascals. And this is definitely in the cirrhosis range. IQR was 27%, reliable scan. ALT was less than 100, 100. So we thought this was a reasonably good scan and it was indicative of cirrhosis. Mind you, I had no clue that I would be dealing uh, with cirrhosis in him when, he, when I saw him in the clinic, based on my clinical acumen. Um, his CAP score was 372 decibels per meter. Um, so this was moderate to severe steatosis. In my mind, I, I kind of classic quantify steatosis, normal, mild versus moderate, severe. And uh, overall, our diagnosis was um, cirrhosis, NAFLD, NASH. So there are many nuances in the use of FibroScan. The machine may be at a different location in the clinic done by a technician. And uh, more recently, we've had open access like endoscopy uh, at our institution. Dermatologists are ordering FibroScan because they have patients on methotrexate. They are concerned about fibrosis. We have my own colleagues who manage patients with inflammatory bowel disease order a FibroScan. Um, so you may not even see the patient when you have the report to interpret. So it's very important to realize the nuances and the team that supports you with regard to getting the fibro scan knows uh, these. More recently, um, we published about the issues that go behind the fibro scan interpretation. We call it myths and mysteries of fibro scan for evaluation of liver fibrosis. There are things that are related to technology. Um, more recently, our FibroScan got upgraded with new hardware, and um, this allows us 
my technician to do the test much faster. There are issues with regard to operator experience. Um, some, uh, have, some leaders in the field have recommended that minimum 100 tests have to be done for your operator to be very good at doing it with minimizing all confounders. Then there may be some variability with regard to operators depending, depending upon their experience. I've had some um, local gastroenterologists, community gastroenterologists email me since uh, the announcement of this webinar asking questions. And one of the questions was, um, patient with ascites, we, we have unpredictable liver stiffness measurement. How do I interpret? Definitely when there is ascites, there's a di distance between the probe to the liver capsule is variable and uh, it may not be reliable. And as, if patient has had liver resection, then stiffness is unreliable. Acute hepatitis may cause elevated liver enzymes and that we pick it up by ALT more than 100. Inflammation itself can affect the liver stiffness. Um, if the stiffness is performed after patient eats within two hours, it can increase portal blood flow that can spuriously increase liver stiffness and congestive hepatopathy may affect the liver stiffness. Beta blockers may affect the portal flow and we still don't know how much of an effect will it ha have on the liver stiffness. And if there is significant weight loss, it may improve the liver fibrosis and it may improve the liver stiffness. Recent alcohol use also may increase the liver stiffness. So there are many confounders that could affect the liver stiffness and all these need to be uh, taken into account when we are interpreting the LSM score. So that's why we look for ALT. We have a standard protocol where we request at least three hours of fasting. We make sure that uh, bilirubin and alphas are seen before we interpret the LSM. For obese people, you need to have access to extra large probe, recent alcohol use, right heart failure causing congestive hepatopathy and spurious increase in the liver stiffness, and then the operator experience. This is one study that looked at the effect of water intake on liver stiffness. Sometimes I have a patient who come to the clinic and I want to do the fibro scan right then and there. And they say they had some coffee or drank some water and I wonder if it affect the liver stiffness. And this is one study that looked at that. This is the time after the water intake. And these are the stiffness scores with the degree of fibrosis by liver biopsy. And this is the percent difference among these scores. At most 3% difference in the stiffness. So we feel comfortable that water or perhaps coffee would not affect the liver stiffness. This is the study that looked at uh, effect of food on intake of liver stiffness. A food intake on liver stiffness. This is the time. This is the stiffness. And as you see, the stiffness varies and comes back to the baseline at around two hours. Just to be sure, we currently recommend three hours of fasting prior to performing a fibro scan. Any diagnostic test should have good diagnostic accuracy, reliability with regard to minimizing the confounders. We talked about these. And then reproducibility, which is very important uh, with regard to inter-observer and intra-observer. In, in this situation, it would be technician doing this test. Currently, we are looking at this issue in our through our NASH CRN. Um, this is a clinical research network with several centers. Um, we looked at 511 NAFLD patients across eight clinical centers. They had fibro skin with liver stiffness and cap performed. Extra large probe was required in 57% of the patients. We generally depend, in, depend on the automatic probe selection tool 
that comes with the device that tells us which probe to use. 5%, uh, sorry, 1% one one refused the procedure after providing informed consent. And 1% had a skin to capsule distance greater than 3.5 centimeters, and we couldn't uh, do the test. So overall, 1% to 2% is the failure rate in our experience. We looked at the reliability when each patient had two tests performed on the same day. The correlation was 0.96, which is very good. Mean difference between the two liver stiffness was 0.16. And with regard to CAP, correlation was 0.81, which is again very good for a human clinical trial. The mean difference was around 24 decibels per meter. Now we looked at how far do they differ? I'll walk you through this graph. This is the liver stiffness measurement. Two, two measurements were performed. The dots are the difference between the two measurements. And this is the average. So 95% of the values are within these two. And um, as you see, most of the darts are around zero, telling us that there's not much difference between the two measurements. There are some that are outside the range. We exactly don't know how to explain this. Hopefully, we will learn more when we analyze the predictors for this discordance. But for the most part, they are very concordant. Similarly is the case with CAP. Overall, we concluded that failure rate of 2%, unreliable in 2%, female gender and base circumference were associated with failed or unreliable exam, excellent intra-observer agreement for LSM and CAP. Some other experts have proposed a two-step screening approach, which is ultrasound in patients predisposed for NAFLD, and if the if there is NAFLD, you can use serum biomarkers and transient elastography. And if they kind of both indicate F2 or greater, consider a liver biopsy. If they don't, then continue to monitor. At IU, if we encounter a patient with suspected NAFLD, we just do fibro scan. We get the cap value. If the stiffness is seven or less, essentially we feel that there's, much, there's not much fibrosis in the liver. Patients still could have NASH, but definitely not fibrosis. We get a sense of degree of steatosis and degree of fibrosis, and we offer lifestyle measure, lifestyle intervention. And we, could, we have the option to repeat the fibro scan until there is concern that the stiffness has increased then we consider a liver biopsy. And if it is greater than 12.5, I generally use that cutoff as concern for cirrhosis. If it is not clinically obvious with thrombocytopenia or imaging study showing nodular contour of the liver, I may subject the patient to liver biopsy. But if it is obvious, then I don't see much role for liver biopsy. And we also use this algorithm to identify patients who would benefit from participating in therapeutic clinical trials. Additional roles for FibroScan include longitudinal assessment. Um, we are just barely scratching in NAFLD with regard to this powerful um, information, which is change in LSM over time. This may help us understand the natural history of NAFLD NASH. In patients who have cirrhosis, we all know there is compensated cirrhosis, there is decompensated cirrhosis, portal hypertension. Um, how would the progression of cirrhosis happen over time or improvement with therapeutic intervention? 
So these are uh, questions that uh, we are eagerly looking forward to use. For example, I had a patient uh, recently, a 63-year-old white woman with NASH cirrhosis, who had gastric bypass in 2006, but her weight has plateaued since then. Her current BMI was 37. She complained of right upper quadrant pain. Liver enzymes have been normal. There is still thrombocytopenia. So I really did not have much to monitor when their liver enzymes have been normal since the gastric bypass. She had a fibro scan in 2014. Her stiffness was 17.3. Her CAP score was 277 at that time. So we did the fibro scan again. Her stiffness was 12.2, which was improved from 17.3 kilopascals. Her CAP score was 324, which suggests that her fat has increased, potentially causing symptomatic hepatomegaly, causing right upper quadrant discomfort. So I was able to counsel the patient in a much more precise way, giving her positive feedback with regard to improvement in the liver stiffness and at the same time telling her that fat is increasing, she needs to be more with it with regard to her lifestyle measures. More recently, there has been some interest with regard to screening for fatty liver in patients with diabetes because these are patients at most risk for NAFLD NASH. Uh, the conclusion was it was not uh, cost effective possibly because there's really no treatment that is FDA approved for treatment of NASH. And it requires histology and the cost related to invasive procedure with histology and compliance. And the cost related to imaging. But if eventually we were to redefine the way we treat NAFLD as NAFLD with clinically significant fibrosis, perhaps we may avoid all these costs, or at least we do a targeted liver biopsy in patients who are high risk for advanced fibrosis. And we have new treatments that help resolve NASH, resolve fibrosis, reverse cirrhosis. Then it could become cost effective to screen for NAFLD NASH in patients at risk. There's also role of uh, liver stiffness measurement in patients with cirrhosis to identify at risk for varices. This is the Bovino uh, recent uh, conference meeting recommendations. If a patient with cirrhosis has 20 kilopascals or greater at two, measure, two, two measurements on different days in fasting condition, there is high risk of them having esophageal varices and screening EGD is recommended. In patients who have less than 20 kilopascals and platelet count greater than 150K, they may have very low chance of having varices and potentially can avoid screening endoscopy. So in summary, uh, fibroscan with Vibration control trends in elastography and cap. At bedside is very useful in the evaluation and management of fatty liver. It may help us identify early on patients at risk for clinically significant fibrosis. It may help limit unnecessary liver biopsies. And longitudinally, it may help us assess changes in fibrosis and steatosis if we have effective treatment interventions. And then it is very important to minimize confounders, especially if it's going to be an open access fibro scan. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Valpalanchi, for that comprehensive presentation. We have active questions coming in. And just a note to all the participants, please type your questions into the question field on your screen so that we can see them and present them to Dr. Valpalanchi. I would like to start out the question and answer period with more of a general global question. Dr. Valpalanchi, you're very involved in the development of new technologies and the validation of new diagnostic technologies. What is your long-term view of the future 
of NAFLD and NASH biomarkers? Um, it will be increasingly relevant and very important, especially considering that we have breakthroughs with regard to therapies. Um, there will be increased emphasis on identifying patients early on and intervene in a cost-effective manner. There will be increased emphasis to categorize patients with advanced fibrosis, especially if the treatments are expensive. Uh, we have seen that with hepatitis C, uh, with insurance asking us to identify patients with advanced fibrosis as a criteria for approval of treatment. We have uh, various treatment options. Some may be more antifibrotic, some may be more NASH specific. So it may be relevant to know uh, which patients may benefit from these treatments and also as a tool to assess response to therapy. So I do think there is um, a lot of need for identifying NASH, NAFLD, fibrosis non-invasively. And to, to that point, one, one additional question for you. Uh, it, it, obviously, you're envisioning a combination of diagnostic tools to include blood serum markers, uh, uh, liver stiffness testing, as you review, uh, CAP attenuation rate as a surrogate marker for steatosis, and of course, liver imaging. How do you view the integration of liver imaging and the liver stiffness and cap technologies? When do you use those respective technologies? Um, it's the availability. For me, FibroScan is in the clinic. It gives me information right away. At the same time, if I have a patient participating in a treatment trial, where precision is very important. Um, you know, we have MRI PDFF as the therapeutic endpoint for many phase two trials. They are also having FibroScan with CAP and LSM. Time will tell if this will match up, but as of now, for research outcomes, it is MRI with PDFF. But MRI for clinical use, routine clinical use, is gonna be very expensive. And for me to assess every six months or every year, um, I think uh, it cost may be prohibitive. So I think uh, cheap, uh, easy access, and um, a technology with minimum confounders is very critical for use in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, thank you. And now I would like to uh, uh, pass to Danielle who would like to pose an additional question from a participant, Danielle? Sure, so we have a couple of questions, but I'll start with um, this one that I think you can probably elaborate on what you just The exact question is, if the goal of FibroScan is to reduce the invasiveness of liver biopsy, would you recommend serial FibroScan annually if kilopascals is suggestive of advanced fibrosis, but not confirmation of cirrhosis? as opposed to proceeding with a liver biopsy, which allows for sampling error. So would you recommend that this patient get FibroScan done on a regular basis as opposed to just sending them for the liver biopsy? Um, great question. At the end of the day, it's all about the patient. If I have a patient um, who undergoes a FibroScan, and it is indicative of advanced fibrosis or at least clinically significant fibrosis. And um, I am looking to offer him lifestyle changes in and I'm looking to see what more can I do. I have vitamin E based on the PREVENTS trial, we use it, but that trial has been done for non-diabetic NASH. There is data to suggest that it would work for diabetic NASH too. But if I, if I have a patient who is very eager and very involved and wants to participate in a treatment trial, then perhaps I would do a liver biopsy and help enroll in a treatment trial because most of the phase three treatment trial, it's still a histologic endpoint. Um, so I would do a liver biopsy 
but um, if I have a patient who's new and this is new diagnosis, and I have some information from FibroScan with regard to CAP and LSM, and I'm counseling, and it says, you know what, give me a chance. I'll come back in six months and we can re talk about liver biopsy. I said, sure. So I think it's end of the day discussion between the provider and the patient. Danielle, you have the next question, please. I do. Um, is there an upper limit on BMI to obtain an accurate fibroscan result? This is a question we get asked quite a bit. Yeah. So the higher the BMI, uh, less chance of having a reliable LSM. But I will let the device uh, tell me your IQR will show you right away if it is less than more than 30%, then uh, it's not going to be any use. And um, the way the shear wave is represented on this report. So we've had luck. Um, generally, the chance of getting reliable LSM is lower in extreme obesity. Uh, next question. If there is a significant variability in the LSM readings, do you typically suggest patient to repeat the test? And what are your parameters um, as far as uh, how often they come to have it repeated, a longer fasting time? Yeah, we struggle with this issue early on. Um, generally, we've had access to the machine uh, without the constraints of billing in the past, and we repeated every three months, every six months. It was free to the patients. They loved it. Our patient satisfaction scores went up. Uh, but we generally don't see that much of variability um, over time. Perhaps uh, if you have two measurements, they may be variable, but once you do the third measurement, you pretty much know what's the real LSM of the patient. Um, but, you know, if it is being billed to a commercial insurance, you, you, you have limitations with regard to how often you can perform this. If there is concern for advanced fibrosis, um, I would definitely recommend confirming with the liver biopsy. Danielle, next question, please. Next question. So I have a, kind of an outside question, but um, when you were talking about water intake affecting your scores, um, have you found that a higher caffeine intake also affects the scores? And have you found that the patients lying supine for an extended period of time also affects your scores? Um, most of the times patients are in supine position for measurement of the stiffness and cap anyway. Um, they walk into the clinic and they lie down on the bed and they get the stiffness measured. So I'm not sure extended uh, supine position would affect the liver stiffness measurement. Um, we have had some hospital hospitalized patients wheel down for stiffness measurement over time and not generally sure it's an patients in the ambulatory setting. So with regard to coffee, um, I am not aware of any publication, but um, a black coffee, if it is just water, um, I'm not thinking that it would affect the portal flow that much, but um, it's all about um, increased portal flow after meal intake that may affect the liver stiffness. Jerry, do you have any more information? No, I, I, I think that is a, a very good summary of, of what we know. Uh, I do have one additional enhancement question uh, related to this topic. Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides uh, that one of the confounders that we need to be careful about in liver stiffness assessment is the inflammatory component. And you mentioned the use of ALT as an indicator. Uh, how do you integrate the ALT value uh, uh, to, uh, shall we say, interpret the liver stiffness value. Yeah, so you you have a patient 
uh, you have an ALT greater than 100, FibroScan is used to estimate the LSM and CAP. So here you are, you have a test that's done very well, but you have an ALT that is high. So basically we tell that this test is not reliable because there could be potentially false elevation in the liver stiffness from the inflammation. Um, and that's where we end and we take that into account. If uh, you still have a normal LSM, then it's reassuring that despite a ALT elevation, the LSM is normal. But if you have a very high LSM, you could actually say, hey, I'm not sure if this is truly indicative of your fibrosis because your ALT is high and perhaps we could repeat this at a later time point when ALT is lower uh, and that would truly indicate the degree of fibrosis. Very good, Daniel. We have time for two more questions. Would you like to pose the next one? Sure. Um, let's see. Your IU management algorithm appears to be entirely based upon stiffness and not CAP results. Along those lines, later stage NASH often has less fat. So how does fat content help you? Yeah, good question. That's why it just goes to the side. I think it helps um, in understanding the degree of steatosis. Um, Oftentimes, uh, patients have right upper quadrant discomfort, and um, we tell them that it is related to fatty liver. Now I have a score that helps me counsel them better. And also, if I, if I have a cap that is low, uh, I am questioning whether the elevated liver enzymes are truly related to NAPLD. Uh, some of my partners um, uh, do take CAP um, much more um, stringently than me. Um, they may subject a patient to liver biopsy with a very high CAP score and normal liver stiffness because they are worried about NASH in those patients. So yes, my uh, approach is mostly related to liver stiffness, but the CAP score is always in my mind when I am uh, going through my uh, algorithm. And Danielle, we have time for one more. Okay, this is a good one. While the medium probe is usually recommended, if the same patient receives a fiber scan test using a medium probe and XL probe, would they be expected to provide the same kilopascal result? Or does the XL probe expect it to be result in a lower kilopascal value? Yeah, for the same patient, if you use medium and extra large probe, Generally, the extra large probe LSMs are a little bit lower than uh, medium probe, but we don't get into that um, situation. We just stick to our protocol, which is basically recommendation by the uh, automatic probe selection tool. So if the patient loses weight, uh, you know, has a bariatric surgery, comes back next time, uh, you have used extra large probe in the past, now you are using medium probe. Uh, you know, I don't know how to interpret that, but I just go by LSM value. Very good. And I think we've consumed all of our time on behalf of all participants. I'd like to thank Dr. Bapalanchi for his very comprehensive presentation. These are indeed exciting times as we have new horizons opening up both in diagnostics and therapeutics for fatty liver disease. I would like to remind all participants that you'll receive a follow-up email announcing how that you can access a recording of this event. And also all participants will soon be be receiving an announcement email of our next webinar event, which will occur on May 11th, and it will talk about the applications of fiber scan in alcoholic liver disease. Thank you to everyone, and thank you for participating.